Uh, hey, good day, everybody. Um, welcome to our introduction to statistics. Statistics is uh, quite a large topic, and we'll try to keep this introductory video a little bit short, right? Today, with statistics, we're going to be dealing with um, graphs and charts, and we'll see what that's all about, yeah? So, when we are dealing with statistics, um, what is statistics? Well, statistics, we deal in with the science of collecting and analyzing large quantities of data. So, statistics is a really, really important topic. And we use statistics for almost everything from government census to to the type of TV that you just watch to the marks of kids in school, shoe sizes, anything that you could think of can be uh, represented as data and therefore we would use statistics, right? Now data, um, data can be in two forms. Um, we'll talk about two forms of data in this class. We'll talk about the numerical form, which is quantitative data. So this has to do with numbers. So numbers, you know, like um, like shoe size, 8.5, or height, 6 feet, all of these are numbers, right? And then we could have qualitative data. So qualitative data is more descriptive. So um, can you think of some... Uh, examples of qualitative data. What if you wanted to find out how people were feeling um, about the whole COVID lockdown situation? Um, you would find a range of feelings. Some people would be sad. Some people would be happy. Some people would be depressed. Some people would be relaxed. So this is certainly not numerical data. This is descriptive data. So this would fall under the qualitative data. Now we could see here an example of a data set and that is basically we have a table and this table we are talking about the amount of money that is spent by a country in one year. So this is the amount of money and we could see that we have different facilities so we have wages and salaries, health education, agriculture, and communications. And this is the amount of money that is spent on each one of those facilities in a year's time, right? So this is an example of um, data in a table or tabulated data. Now, let's talk about ways that we could represent data. And we're definitely going to be talking about bars and charts here. Now, the first thing we're going to talk about is a proportion bar. Right? Now, what is a proportion bar? It's a visual representation using a single bar to show the proportional view of data. Now, it might sound fancy, but it's actually quite simple. Now, let's take a look at this data here. We can see that this data here um, is the same data that we saw with the wages and salaries, the, um, the amount of money spent by a country in one year. And we can see down here the total amount of money spent by the country was $90 million. And that is our total amount spent, right? So let's see how we work this. The question is, Use a proportion bar of, of a height 10 units, whether it's centimeters or millimeters, um, you know, just 10 units in this case, to represent the data shown. So we're going to use a proportion bar to represent the data in this table, right? So we want to see, first of all, we have our bar on the side here, and you can see it, right? And that bar will have that bar being 10 units high. So this entire bar, this entire length of 10 units will cover all the money that is spent. So all the money that is spent, as we can see, the total here is 90 million. So therefore, 
the total money spent is 90 million and that would be equal to the total height of the bar which is 10 units so now we need to find out how much of the bar is taken up by wages and salaries so if the full 90 million is 10 units which is the full height of the bar what height of the bar would wages and salaries take up well wages and salaries we could see here um, 33 million so what we want to do is find out what is the fraction of the total and multiply that by the total height so the fraction would be 33 million over the 90 million and we are multiplying that by the total height so what we are doing here is we are finding the fraction of the total height and we could see that that fraction is 3.6 units right so can you find what um, what is the fraction of the height for all of the rest of the facilities here we have health education agriculture communications so see if you could pause the video and find out what height would represent each one of these facilities right so hopefully you pause the video and you would have gotten these answers over here so for health health is 24 million so that's a fraction of 24 over the total which is 90 and this fraction here multiplied by the total height will give us the fraction of that height that represents this 24 yeah so same thing with all of these we could see here that um, education was 15 million and it ended up being 1.6 units um, agriculture is 13 million it ended up being 1.4 units and communications is 5 million and that ends up being just 0 0.5 units so now how do we put this on a proportion graph well we could start with the largest amount of units first so we have the wages and salaries here and from zero this and this height here would be 3.6 so this height here would be 3.6 right that is 33 um, out of 90 of the full height yeah now we have here this um, block represents health and this health height here would be 2.6 units yeah of the total height now we have our education and our education this height here would be 1.6 units we have the agriculture which is 1.4 units in height and then we have our communications which is the smallest amount 0 0.5 units so what a proportion bar is good for is that you could really really see which one of these facilities um, has the most spending you could really tell which one use uses the most money we could see here that wages and salaries definitely takes up a lot more money than agriculture or communication so a proportion bar is really good to see the proportions of the data that you're dealing with compared to the total so a proportion bar could also be um, horizontal as you could see here it does not always have to be vertical so we can have draw our proportion bar horizontally as well now let's talk about a bar or column chart and this is another way that we can describe our uh, data right so we have the same data here um, which is the amount of money spent by a country in a year now a bar chart consists of vertical rectangular bars of the same width and you'd notice that they are drawn spaced apart so we have a space between them and each bar represents a different facility so this bar represents wages and salaries and we could see here that wages and salaries are clocking in 
at around 33 million. Um, we have health, and we could see here that the health on the graph comes in at around 24 million. So obviously, this y-axis here represents our dollars, the money in millions. And then this x-axis here term represents the different bars for the different facilities. And we can see here that in a bar chart, we don't really get the proportion to the whole, you know. We can't really see um, how wages and salaries compare to the entire total amount of money spent. But we can see how wages and salaries compare to health and how that compares to education. We can see that we spent a considerable a lot more on wages and salaries. So bar charts and bar columns are really easy to draw. They're really easy to read. And, um, and they could give us a lot of information as well. Just like the um, proportion bar, a bar chart um, or a column chart can also be horizontal, as we could see here. So we could have these charts vertically, or we could have them horizontally, but they give us the same information. We could see that the wages and salaries here um, will clock in at around 33 million. So, um, so they do give us the same information. A chronological bar chart. Now, a chronological bar chart is just that. It shows chronology. A bar chart showing the progression of a certain piece of data over time. Now, let's check out this data set we have here in this table. This shows the total budget spent over five years. So we have in 2001, this country spent $33 million. In 2002, this country spent $24 million. In 2003, the country spent $34 million, and so on and so forth, right? So on our y-axis here, we could see that we have the money in millions, right? <clears throat> and... On our x-axis here, for the different columns, you could see we have the different years. So each different year, we could actually see and compare one year to the next year. We could see that we spent a lot of money in 2001, and then there was actually a dip in spending in 2002. And then from 2002, there was a steady increase in spending year after year after year. So this is a chronology bar chart, where we use a bar chart with um, time, usually on the x-axis, to show the progression of data over a certain period of time. A line graph. Now, a line graph is one that you might be very familiar with. It resembles um, those graphs and charts that we saw in coordinate geometry. And in this case, a line graph could also be used to show progress of data over time. So we could see here that in 2001, um, the country spent $33 million, And so that's in 2001. We have that dot here, right? Um, in 2002, we spent $24 million. In 2003... It went up to about 34 million. In 2004, we were at 45 million. In 2005, we're at 48 million. And in 2006, we were at 53 million. Right? So we could see here from the line graph that we can actually just connect the points and it shows us this steady we can easily see from one point to the other over time we can see a decline or we can see a rise and it has a lot of information that we could get from a line graph now another type of chart that we could use to um, compare information is the pie chart now a pie chart compares the proportions 
So it's just like the proportion bar where we could see the proportions in relation to the total or the whole, right? So a pie chart compares the proportions of different data sets compared to the whole. The whole is represented as a circle of 360 degrees. Now we'll see how a pie chart works, right? The question here is represent the data on a pie chart where the total, which is 90 million, is equal to 360 degrees. If we could look at it here, we we are back to looking at that um that first uh that very first table that we were looking at there. The amount of money spent by a country in one year and we saw the wages being 33 million, the health being 24 million, education being 15 million, and so on. Right? Now, the total money that was spent is 90 million. So, the total money is going to represent our full circle, 360 degrees. Right? Now, what um, part of the circle would wages and salaries represent? Well, we worked this out in the same way that we worked out the proportion bar. We could see here that wages and salaries are 33 over the total 90. Now, this is the fraction of the whole amount that wages and salaries are taken up. We multiply that by the total 360, and that gives us 132 degrees. So this fraction would represent 132 degrees of the circle, right? Now, can you pause the video and see if you could work out how many degrees would each one of these facilities be as a part of the full circle? So pause the video and... Uh, Good luck. Right, so hopefully you worked it out. And if you worked it out, we could see here that health is going to take up 96 degrees of the circle. Um, uh, education is going to take up 60 degrees of the circle. Agriculture is 52 degrees. And communications is just 20 degrees. Now, when we draw our chart, we're going to see here, you know, the full circle is a full 360 degrees, right? And from any starting point, we could start to measure, and when we measure here, 132 degrees, this is for our wages, right? Then from this point here, we can measure our 96 degrees for health, Definitely here, we could see that, um, that, that a pie chart just basically tells us or, or shows us the proportions in, compared to the entire circle. So we could see here that wages take up a really huge amount of the circle. Yeah? And we could easily see the proportion of, um, of one, one um, data set from another as compared to the total. So a pie chart is very, very useful for that. Now let's take a look at a frequency table, right? Now a frequency table tells us how popular or how frequent a certain piece of data occurs. How popular or how frequent a certain piece of data occurs. So what we have here is we have a a uh, 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 table and the table gives us the scores for 40 participants in a shooting competition and these scores are out of seven right so these are the scores for 40 participants so 40 people um, competed in this shooting competition and these are their scores now, let's see if we could draw a frequency table, which will make this entire table a little easier to read because this table here just looks like a bunch of numbers. doesn't really help us much. But um, let's try a frequency table. So what I'm going to do here is I'm going to put on one side the score. Now, we know the score is out of 7. So that means that people could get a score of 0. They could get a score of 1. They could get a score of 2, they could get a score of 3, 4, 5, 6, or 7. So having said that, 
um, let's look at all of the people that got a score of zero. All right. So let's look through our entire data set. We have to analyze the entire table and find all of the people that got a score of zero. So what do we have here? Look, one person has a score of zero, two, three, four, five, and six. So what we have here, we have six people having a score of zero. So this is the frequency. This is how popular the score of zero is. The score of zero was gotten by six people. So this is the frequency of that score. This is how many times this score of zero will appear, right? So, of course, the higher the number is the higher the frequency, yeah? So, can you work out the frequency of all of the other scores? Um, pause the video and see if you could tell me what are the frequencies of the other scores. How many times, how many people got a score of 1? How many people got a score of 2? How many people got a score of 3? Right? So pause the video and see if you can fill out and complete this frequency table. Right. So hopefully you paused the video and hopefully you worked it out. And these are the numbers that I got. Um, so we could see here that three people got a score of one. Right. Four people got a score of two and three. Right. Five people got a score of four. Six people got a score of five, seven people, and so on, right? Now, you could see here that this table is a little more helpful than this one. This one just gives us our raw data. So this is the data that was collected on the day, and it hasn't been analyzed yet. And this one here is our analyzed data. Now, this data has been analyzed, and we could see here that it could give us a lot of information as to, you know, how many people are doing badly out of the 40, how many people are doing badly and getting bad scores. So, how many people here got a score of less than 3? So, we could easily calculate that 4 and 4 is 8, 9, 10, 11. 11 and 6 is 17. So 17 people here got a score of 3 or less, right? So we can actually get a lot of information from a frequency table. It's very, very useful and very handy when it comes to analyzing data. Now a histogram. We could see here that a histogram, it looks like a... It looks like a, a, a bar chart or a column graph, but it is a little bit different. We use a histogram when usually we're talking about frequencies. So when you have your frequency table, we would usually use a histogram to uh, chart this frequency table. Now, we could see here the main difference between a histogram and a bar chart. Well, one of the differences is that in a histogram, there is no space between the bars here. Yeah, The bars are touching each other. They're jammed up against each other. Remember, in a bar graph, the bars had spaces between them. Right? So in a histogram, there are no spaces between the bars. None. No spaces, right? Um, so a histogram is usually used to represent frequency. And what we usually do is we usually have this y-axis here to represent the frequency, right? So we could see here in terms of frequency, the highest number is 7. So we could have our y-axis going up to about 7 or 8, yeah? And now each bar here, each bar would represent the score, Right, So each bar on the x-axis will represent our score. So now we could see visually how many people got a score of 0. We could visually see how many people got a score of 6. 
so we could see from a histogram that um, the majority of people, seven people, um, got a score of six, which is the biggest group that we have here. Right? We could also do a lot of calculations from a histogram. We can tell, can you work out how many people got a score of five and over? Well, we could even work that out from the table, but we could see that six people here got a score of five, right? Um, seven people got a score of six, and then five people got a score of seven, right? Five people here. So we could see that from our table. So the histogram, just to recap, we have the scores 1, 2, 3, 4, and we have the frequency here, which is how many people, right? And we could see here that who got a score of 0? Six people got a score of 0. Who got a score of 1? Well, three people got a score of 1. And what about a score of 2? Well, four people got a score of 2. Right? So a histogram is usually used when we are dealing with frequency tables. When we take a lot of raw data and we form a frequency table out of it, we, um, we end up, uh, the histogram is one of the better things to use to represent the data. Now we can see that these graphs are really, really handy, especially when you're dealing with large amounts of data. Um, that would using histograms and charts and pie charts and all of these things could help us see the information quite easily and we could make decisions based on the information rather than you know filing through tables and tables of data yeah so these charts are really really useful and being able to draw them and interpret them and understand them is um, is very essential now, a frequency polygon. Now, let's look back here at our histogram for a minute, right? Now, if I was to take the midpoint of each one of these bars here, and I'll just take the midpoint of each one of these bars, and I was to connect this midpoint by a line, right? And, uh, well, it's supposed to be as straight as possible, right? A straight line, right? And, you know, we could get here from here, we could see the, um, the line graph being formed, right? So this line graph, we could see a drop here. We could see a rise here. We could see another drop over here, right? So this line graph being formed is not really a line graph. What it is, is something called a frequency polygon, right? So you can see the shape there, and you can see the shape here, right? So from the table, we have zero people. Uh, sorry, zero. How many people has a score of zero? Well, six people. So we can see here that we have the frequency, the amount of people on the y-axis, right? And we have the scores on the x-axis. So, how many people got a score of zero? Six people. How many people got a score of one? Three people. How many people got a score of two? Um, four people. Four people also got a score of three. How many people got a score of four? We have five people. How many people got a score of five? We have six people. How many people got a score of six? We have seven people. And how many people got a score of seven? We have five people. All right? So once we have these points, we can now connect them and draw our frequency polygon. And our frequency polygon helps to give us a lot of information, just like the histogram. Right? Um, another thing that is really, really common is for a question to ask you to find the area under a frequency polygon. And you can imagine how you would find the area of this polygon. So this polygon is bounded by this, these lines here. And your x-axis. 
and how you would have to find the area of something like this is you would have to split it up into its smaller shapes. So we see we have a trapezium here, a couple of trapeziums, some rectangles, more trapeziums. So the area, the formula for the area of a trapezium will come in handy. Now, what is the formula of the area of a trapezium? Do you guys remember? So just a reminder, the area of a trapezium is a half the sum of the parallel sides multiplied by the height. So I have these parallel sides here, A and B, and then this here would technically be my perpendicular height, H, right? So um, so this is how we generally find the area of a trapezium, just a little bit of a reminder. And this um, formula comes in quite handy when it comes to uh, working a frequency polygon and finding the area under a frequency polygon. Now we are talking about variables, and we spoke a little bit about this before. We often have to deal with different types of data. So the different types of data, um, so from data, we, we saw that we have two types. We have the quantitative, which we are dealing with numbers, and then we have the qualitative, which is more descriptive, right? Now, in terms of the quantitative, you can see that we have two different types of quantitative data, right? Um, we have discrete data and we have continuous data. Now, what is the difference between discrete data and continuous data? Well, discrete data, we are dealing with definite values. Now, usually they are whole numbers, but they don't have to be whole numbers, but they are definite values. So, for example, an example of discrete data would be shoe size, you know? You'll have a shoe size of six, and then you'll have another shoe size of six and a half, and then you have seven, and then seven and a half. So, you have shoe sizes of six, six and a half, seven, but it I have no in between. It I have no 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 six point two five. It I have no six point seven five. It don't have none of these guys, right? You're basically stuck with a size six or a size six and a half. So this is discrete data where you're dealing with definite values, right? Now continuous data, right? can take any value within a continuous range. So an example of continuous data could be height, right? Like if you had someone who, when they were young, um, let's just say when they were six years old, they were four feet in height. And then when they became an adult, they were six feet in height. Now, of course, at any point in time between this point and this point, they would have passed through a continuous range of height. They could have been 5.275 feet tall, or they would have been um, 5.983 feet tall. So this is continuous data where there is no separation between the numbers. You are continuously going along a string of numbers within a range. Now we're dealing with something called grouped data, right? Now grouped data is particularly useful when we are talking about large quantities of data. So let's take a look at this table here. So we can see with this table here, we have the final marks for 20 students. So these are 20 students and these are their final marks at the end of the year. And show sure, it just looks like a bunch of numbers in a table. But let's group these numbers together. So what we could have here is we could say, well, okay, these are the final marks. Let's do a frequency table here. And look at what we did. We put the score or the marks, 
all right? But we put them in a range. So all of the people that got between 1 and 20, all of the people that got between 21 and 40, all of the people that got between 40 and 60. So, first of all, can you tell me all of the people that got between 1 and 20? Well, let's just take a look at it here. 1 and 20. What we want to find is how many people got between 1 and 20. So, how many people got between a score of 1 and 20? How many people fall? How many students fall into this 1 to 20 mark bracket? So let's check our marks here. Are we seeing any marks that are between 1 and 20? Well, look, I have one student here. And I have another student here. Right. So we have, apparently, we have two students that got between 1 and 20. Now, can you pause the video and see if you can finish this out? Right? So how many students got between 21 and 40? How many students got between um, uh, 41 and 60? Right? So pause the video and see if you could complete this frequency table. Right, so hopefully um, you guys got these numbers here. So we have four students that got between 20 and 40. We have four students that got between um, 41 and 60. Um, we have three students that got between 61 and 80, and we have seven students that got between 81 and 100. Now, you could see that um, this information is a lot more useful than just having a table with numbers. This table with numbers could be confusing, right? And it's only when we analyze this raw data... And when we analyze this raw data, then we could get something useful. So we could have a sense here to see that we have a lot of students here getting between 81 and 100. And we do have a few students. So how many students here are failing? How many students here are getting um, 40 and below? We could see here that six students are getting 40 and below, right? So we could tell um, a lot of information from a frequency table. Now, let's talk about these class intervals. Now, obviously, you can see here that we separated the data into a range. And each one of these ranges is called a class interval. So you can see here that we have our first class interval goes from 1 to 20. And our second class interval goes from 21 to 40. So the class interval is just simply the range that we use, right? The class limits. So the class limits have to deal with these numbers here, right? The lower limit and the upper limit that form a class interval. So, for example, if I have a class interval of 41 to 60, I could see the lower limit is 41 and the upper limit is 60. So the lower limit is 41 and the upper limit is 60. Right? So this is what we talk about when we refer to class limits. Class boundaries. Now, this is a little bit tricky. So please pay special attention to the class boundary. Now, you could see here that the first class interval goes from 1 to 20 in terms of marks. And then the second class interval goes from um, 21 to 40. So the first class interval goes from 1 to 20. And then the second class interval goes from 21 to 40. Right? So the question is, what if a student got here? Let, let's just say a student got 20 
20.7 marks, right? So a student's final mark is 20.7. Which class interval would you put him in, right? Which class interval does he belong to? Well, this is where we talk about class boundaries, right? So <clears throat> what we are dealing with here is even though we have a class interval of 1 to 20, what we usually do to set the boundary is we will usually go 0.5 below the lower limit and then 0.5 above the upper limit. So the boundary here would actually be, the upper boundary here would be 20.5, right? And the lower boundary here would be 0 0.5. So in this case, we could see here that this boundary here is the boundary between the first two class intervals, right? So we have the 21 to 40 over here. And this boundary of 20.5 is the line between these two intervals here. So we could see that the student who got 20.7 would belong to this second class interval here because he is above that lower boundary, yeah, of 20.5. So when we're dealing with class boundaries, what we do for a class boundary is you take the class interval, so let's just take the other example of 61 to 80, and then you just take 0.5 below the lower one, so that'll be 60.5, and then you go 0.5 above the upper limit, so that would be 80.5, and these are our class boundaries. So our class boundaries help to stitch the intervals together smoothly so that nobody gets left out, <clears throat> if, especially if they don't fall um, comfortably within an interval. So when we are talking about the class midpoint, we have to calculate the class midpoint um, using our boundaries. Boundaries. So let's just take this class interval here. We have 21 to 40, right? That's the second interval here. What is the midpoint of this interval? Well, to find the midpoint, we have to use our class boundaries. So the boundaries, remember, would be 0.5 less than the lower limit. So that would be 20.5. And then what we are going to do is we're going to add our upper class boundary, which is 0.5 above the upper limit. And then we are just going to divide that by 2. And that will give us our midpoint. So the midpoint of this boundary is approximately 30.5. All right, so this is how we find the class midpoint. We have to use not the limits of the interval, but the boundaries of the interval, right, in order to find a proper midpoint. Now let's talk about class width. Now, of course, the uh, class width is going to tell us how wide or how big the interval is, right? So let's just consider this interval here, the interval of 61 to 80, right? Now, 61 to 80 is our class interval, and we want to calculate the class width. Now, how we do this is we have to use, again, the boundaries, Right? The class width would be our upper boundary minus the lower boundary. So what is the upper boundary? The upper boundary, this upper limit here is 80, so the boundary would be 0.5 more, which is 80.5. And we are going to minus 
the lower boundary, so the lower limit here is 61. So we go 0.5 lower than that, so that's 60.5, and that gives us our boundary. And therefore, the width of this class interval is 20. Now, we could definitely see that just by looking at the interval. However, um, sometimes we are dealing with large amounts of data, and the intervals are much, much larger. So, um, so this is usually how we could determine how big an interval actually is. Now, see if you could finish this table here when we were talking about class boundaries, right? See if you can write down the class boundary for each one of these class intervals. We could see here that this lower limit is 1 and the upper limit is 20. So we have to go 0.5 lower than the lower limit. So this boundary here will be 0 0.5 to 20.5, right? And then same thing over here. We have to go 0.5 less than 21, so that'll be 20.5 to 40.5. And similarly, we'll have 40.5 to 60.5, and then 60.5 to 80.5, and then finally, 80.5 to technically 100.5. Now, you can see here that we have boundaries that are being shared, and so we could tell that... Um, that these boundaries help to stitch up um, and close any holes that might be between the class intervals. So these are why these boundaries are so important. Now let's talk about cumulative frequency. Now the cumulative frequency basically has to do with adding all of these frequencies up. So we could see here that two students got between 1 and 20, all right? We could also see here that four students got between 20 and 40, all right? So how many total students got below 40? So 40 and below. So that would be this 4 plus this 2, which is 6 students, right? So this is kind of what a cumulative frequency is. A cumulative frequency, we add up the frequencies as we go down the table. So instead of having a class interval, what I would do is I would just have a range. So how many students got less than 20? Well, we could see here that two students got less than 20. How many students got less than 40? Well, it would be this 4 plus this 2 which would give us six, yeah? How many students got less than 60? Well, it'll be this four plus this four plus this two. So four and four is eight, so this would be 10, yeah? Um, how many students got below 80, right? It would be this three here plus the 10 from below, which would be 13. And then how many students got um, less than 100 or 100 or less? Well, it would be this 7 plus the 13, which gives us 20. Now, we could see here that with a cumulative frequency table, how you know if you've done it correctly is if we've, the last, the very last value should be the total amount of students that we have, which in this case is 20, yeah? So again, in order to find a cumulative frequency, we just basically add up all of these frequencies for each class one step at a time, yeah? Now, let's talk about the histogram, right? Now, the histogram, as we spoke about before, is often used to talk about a, uh, a frequency, basically. Now, we saw before that we were using just um, discrete information, discrete scores, and the frequency of those scores. But now, we're actually using intervals. 
So how do we describe intervals on a histogram? Well, we could see here on this histogram, we pretty much do it the same way. We have the y-axis giving us our frequency of students. And then the x-axis gives us our intervals of marks or scores, right? So we could see here how many students got between 1 and 20. Well, two students. How many students got between 21 and 40? We could see here four students. So each one of these bars, just like a normal frequency histogram, um, tells us uh, uh, the, 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 the frequency per, uh, per class interval. However, one thing to note is to note the boundary. Remember, these, this line here is the line that separates the first class to the second class. So technically, this line is represented by 20.5, yeah? This line here is the boundary between this class and this class. So this would be 40.5, which is the upper boundary of this class and the lower boundary of this third class here. So this line over here is actually 60.5, and that's what this line would represent. This line here would represent 80.5. So just keep in mind, it's incredibly important to label or write in your boundaries when you are dealing with a histogram that is um, being drawn from class intervals, yeah? It's, um, it's often um, specified that you should, um, you should definitely write down what your boundaries are on the histogram itself. Now, a cumulative frequency curve. And we spoke about cumulative frequency, and we saw that um, this is our cumulative frequency here. And the cumulative frequency curve is pretty simple in terms of how we plot it. Again, we have our frequency on the, uh, the y-axis. And then we have um, the scores on the x-axis, right? So how many students? The frequency is basically students. So the cumulative frequency, how many students got less than 20? Well, two students, so we just plot that point there. Um, how many students got less than 40? Well, there's six students, so we plot that point there. Six. Six students. How many students got less than 60? Well, 10 students. How many students got less than 80? 13 students. And how many students got less than 100? Well, 20 students here. And once we connect all of these, what we have here is something called a cumulative frequency curve. And we can see that the cumulative frequency curve is very, very helpful. So we could, um, we could easily look at this. And instead of reading through a lot of data and tables and information, we could just look at this and we could basically see that, okay, this is the 80, the 80 mark line here. And how many students in total got below 80? Well, it would be about 13 students here. So we could easily use a cumulative frequency curve to read off um, information uh, visually. Yeah. And that is it for our first uh, class on statistics. What we saw today was um, we saw that we could have various types of data. We could have data in the form of numbers, which is quantitative data. And we could have data in the form of descriptions, which is qualitative data. Please remember, in terms of the quantitative or numerical data, we have two types. We have discrete data and we have continuous data. So um, so we could see here that we could have the, the raw data in tables, and sometimes having raw data in tables might be a little bit too much to, 
to, to look at. We need to analyze the data and simplify the data so it'll be a lot easier to understand. And some ways of analyzing data would be to form frequency tables. Um, and other ways would be to draw graphs and charts so the data could be easily seen and recognized. So I'd invite you to please learn all of the different um, types of charts and graphs that you have seen in this video here. And uh, we will continue with statistics too in our next video. So have a good day.